Okay, so let's now put together everything that we have learned in the past few lessons. So here is our lead acid battery once again, and we're going to focus specifically on the construction of the lead acid battery. So let's take a cross section, and we can see there that we've got all the internal components and we have some labels. What I'm actually going to do, I'm going to go back to the full view for a moment because I want to go through each of the parts individually. The first thing that we have is a container. That is the entire black case, including the cover. And the cover and the sides and the base, that all forms the container. The container itself needs to be mechanically strong, resistant to corrosion. And finally, it needs to be a good insulator because if it's not, then we're gonna get electron flow from the positive to the negative terminal. So that's everything that a container should be. Often you'll find that the containers are heat sealed and that prevents the cover from separating from the main body of the container. The next items of interest are the terminals. We have one terminal that is red and has a positive icon. That indicates that we have our positive terminal, also sometimes referred to as a positive post. On the opposite side of the container, we have a negative terminal, which is usually black in color. Remember, wherever possible, try to use the icons to find out what the polarity at each of the terminals is. If you have a voltmeter, then that's fine. But if not, then use the icons rather than the colors because the colors, depending upon where you live, may sometimes change. This red and black coloring that we're using here may not always be the case. Sometimes there may be no color indication on the battery terminals whatsoever. Notice that the battery terminals here, they have a very large cross-sectional area that allows us to connect the battery internal circuit to the external circuit and we allow the electrons to flow out of the battery. The thinner we have the conductor, the more heat we're going to generate on the conductor as the electrons flow out or as the amps are drawn out of the battery. So we want to have a relatively large conductor in order that the conductor doesn't become too hot. What would actually happen on this particular battery terminal, you can actually see that we have a hole here. So we can assume that a bolt would normally pass through there and we'd be able to clamp our connection directly onto the terminal using a nut and bolt. If you use a spring type washer, that also ensures that the nut does not come loose over time. We have six individual cells on this battery. We can see the top of the cells here, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Each cell will be approximately 2.1 volts or two volts. And that means that when we connect these cells in series, we're actually gonna get 12 volts out. Now these caps are actually used for two reasons. One is to allow gas to escape. This would be hydrogen and oxygen gas. So any gas that is generated during discharging and charging will actually be vented through these individual caps. So you can think of these as vents rather than just caps, but you may wish to remove the caps. And the reason you're gonna remove the caps is to top up the electrolytes or to take a sample with a hydrometer. If you take a sample with a hydrometer, then you can measure the specific gravity. Not all batteries are going to have caps or vents like this. You may see on VRLA type lead acid batteries that they have one cap. This is actually a safety relief valve or a pressure relief valve. And that allows any gas that is generated within the battery to escape if the pressure rises above a certain point. VRLA batteries are also called recapture or recombine batteries. And what that means is the oxygen and the hydrogen are not normally allowed to escape out of the battery. However, if they do, then you will be able to use a vent or a pressure relief valve to allow the gases to escape. So different batteries, different design variations. We can see we've got some information on the back of the battery. This normally relates to the voltage of the battery, which we can actually see is 12 volts and the capacity 
10 amp hours, 20 hours, and do not disassemble or heat above 60 degrees Celsius or incinerate. Batteries must be recycled or should be recycled. Don't ever throw them in the bin. Concerning heating the battery up, yes, if we heat it above 60 degrees, we're not only going to risk damage in the battery, but we're going to reduce its useful working service life a lot. So always read the back of the battery and take note of the information and guidance that it gives you because it will actually be quite useful. Let's now take away the cover and the container itself and we can have a look at some of the internals. So now we can see we've still got our battery posts. We'll use those as reference points. So we've got our negative terminal here and our positive on the left. And we can also see that this battery is connected in series. So we've got our positive terminal here and we have our negative terminal here. And when we connect an external load, we're gonna take the electrons from the positive terminal and allow them to flow to the negative terminal. We can see that the cells are joined in series. They're actually joined like so. So we'll add up all of those two voltages from each cell in order to get 12 volts. The items that join the cells together are called intercell connectors. That's these large conductor bars here. And you can actually see that they join some of the cells directly together and at the opposite end. We're going to actually have one of these intercell connectors, for example, for the negative plates, and that will join to the positive plates here, and the negative plates here, positive plates there, and the negative plates on this one again. So that is how we will join all of the cells together using these intercell connectors. The negative plates are always on the outside of each cell. So this will be negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. The positive plates can be considered the working part of the battery and that is why we always surround the positive plates with negative plates. That means in practice that there's always going to be one more negative plate than positive plate. Now let me just configure this now so we can have a look at one individual plate. So what we're actually looking at now are the positive plates. A battery may contain over 100 individual plates. We don't have that many here because we don't need that many for instruction purposes. But you can see that each plate is very thin. They have a very large cross-sectional area and that means that a large amount of electrolyte can come into contact with each plate. And because the electrolyte is going to have such a large contact surface area with each plate, we're going to get a very good chemical reaction or an efficient chemical reaction. If we just had a solid block of plate, then the material or the active material in the middle of the plate is not going to come into contact with the electrolyte and that means that we're not going to get a chemical reaction which means we're not going to get any electron flow. So very large cross-sectional area. If we were looking at a starter battery these plates are going to be very thin and if we're looking at a deep cycle battery the plates are going to be slightly thicker. Deep cycle batteries also have a larger amount of space between the plates and the containers and that allows any active material that forms flakes to drop off and accumulate in the base of the container. Each plate essentially consists of a lead oxide material that has been pressed onto a grid. So we'll have this grid that you're looking at now. And what we'll do, we'll lay that grid down on a flat surface area and we'll take a wet lead oxide material and squeeze it into all of these gaps. Once we've squeezed the lead oxide into all of the gaps, what we're actually gonna do is slightly dry it out and that then will form our plate. The reason batteries are so heavy is simply because lead is very dense and is very heavy. If we're using a different material rather than lead, then batteries might not be heavy at all. Let's have a look now at the separators. So 
So you can see that we've got separators placed on either side of the positive plates. The separators are made of a porous material that allows the electrolyte to flow freely between the positive and negative plates. Let me add the negative plates again. So we can see that we've got a negative plate here and another one here and another one here and the positive plate sandwiched in the middle. But they're kept apart by the separators. So you can see negative plate, separator, positive plate, separator, negative plate, separator, positive plate, separator, negative plate. So always two negatives on the outside. So we're allowing the electrolyte to flow freely between the positive and negative plates. But we don't want the plates to join together because then we're going to get a short. So it's important we keep the plates separate, but not so far apart that we're going to hinder the chemical reaction. Now the electrolyte itself is going to be filled up to a level above the plates. The electrolyte is actually the only thing that we can't see. Let me just take the cross section. And we can see that the electrolyte will come above the plates up to approximately this level here. And that will ensure that the electrolyte comes into contact with the entire surface area of each plate, which will give us a very good chemical reaction, or at least a very efficient chemical reaction. If the plates are not completely submerged in electrolyte, then we are reducing the chemical reaction that can occur, and thus we're reducing the capacity of the battery. The electrolyte itself, remember, is going to be a mixture of sulfuric acid and water, and roughly this mixture is going to be about 30 or 40% sulfuric acid, maybe 35%, and the other 65% is going to be water or H2O. So now you know exactly how a battery is constructed, you know all of the components involved, you know what each component does and the reasoning why. Remember there may be different variations depending on the type of lead acid battery that you are looking at, but many of these components are common to several designs of battery, particularly the electrodes, which are actually just the plates, and the electrolyte, which may be wet or dry. For some batteries, the container itself will form one of the electrodes, but these are generally much smaller batteries, such as a AA or a AAA battery. If you like this video and would like to see more engineering related tutorials, then check out some of the links in the video description area. And if you click on these links, you'll get a special discount price for all of our engineering video courses. If you want to support the channel, then please do like this video or share it on social media. It really does help us out. You can also leave a comment in the comments section. And if you've got any questions, then please just ask and I will try to respond to you within 48 hours. Thanks very much for your time.